Esperamos dos minutos. ¿Dónde está el caso? El, para cambiar esto. Ah. Lo único que... Sí, no molestas, ¿eh? Vale. Lo único es si podéis hablar cerca del micro, o sea, baja. <coughs> sí, el micro, si podéis hablar cerca del micro. Vale. Sí. No, lo puedes acercar, lo puedes así. mover, sí. lo puedes, exacto, porque así se ve. Bueno, ¿me ha dicho un, dos mm. minutos? Sí, sí. Ah, tienes agua. No, 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 necesitas. Sí, toma un poquito. Está bien el sitio. Ah, sí, el sitio es bueno. Bueno. Y este, los bloques, todo muy bien. Es todo. Muy bien. Hola, buena tarde. Eh, bueno, paso el inglés porque la charrada está, la conferencia está programada en inglés, así que haremos esta sesión en inglés. Pero ve, sabía que el profesor Santos anten y esta defensa en castellano y por si algú que está ya hace preguntas, no nos lo puedo hacer en español con alguien acabado. So, uh, welcome here, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, I'm very glad to introduce you to Professor Maciel Santos. He has a PhD in history and is a teacher, a professor at History Department of Facultad de Letras de Universidad de Deporto. He's also a researcher at the Center for African Studies of Oporto University and current director of Africana Studia, the publication, the international publication of the center. He's also the author of several publications on colonial Africa and labor history. And well, I had the pleasure to listen to him a few months ago. It was a very interesting uh, conference, seminar in fact, uh, about uh, imperialism and colonialism and that's why he's here. We were very glad to invite him. So now just listen to him very carefully and enjoy him. Thank you. <clears throat> Buenas tardes, and I'll stick to that, <laughs> to not embarrass the institution. Uh, it's very good for me to, to, to be here for the first time, not in Barcelona, but at the Institute. And I'll try to um, give you uh, an insight of a recent research uh, uh, that we carried out at the center, and me in particular, about some aspects of Portuguese uh, foreign um, relations, and uh, in this case related to the Suez crisis. You know that the, the 
I'll try to speak as slowly as I can to give you the, the, the without interference and noise. In, uh, uh, but if you have some problem in understanding, please let me know. Uh, you know that the Suez crisis is, um, uh, let's say, uh, a very uh, a commonplace in the history of the Middle East. A lot of things has been written, uh, especially in the one or two decades after uh, the events. But most of these earlier writings were not supported by uh, archivistic material because it was not available. What uh, I did uh, was to collect some of this uh, archivistic material in the Portuguese Foreign uh, Ministry. And this gives uh, a, a double um, new outlook of the crisis because it shows the backstage of some of what the major powers really wanted. And it also shows the point of view of some minor participants in the crisis, which was the Portuguese case. So what I will do is to give you first, uh, let's say, the international context. And I will also summarize the main events, because most of you might know, some of you uh, uh, might not be much familiar with that. And then I'll try to show you some hidden aspects of uh, this crisis. Uh, and uh, as you know, this crisis is a major turning point in the history of the Middle East. If you uh, wanted to select two uh, phenomena very uh, important in the history of the Middle East in the 20th century, you could point out the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and then the Suez Crisis. More than the uh, Six Days War, the Suez Crisis was, uh, as for the reasons you'll see, the, the, the major turning point of the history of the Middle East. So, <clears throat> I will start with the international context, and especially with oil contests, because as you know, uh, what was the main force of the Western powers to go to the, to the Middle East was ma mainly oil. Um, in 19, um, 1956, at uh, the time of the Suez Crisis, the Middle East had already become the epicenter of the oil industry. The United States rem remained the major oil producer, uh, about 42% of the world output. But nearly half of the oil reserves of the United States were already used up, which means that the United States were already seeing this region of the world as the, the major center of the oil industry. Uh, but the, the Middle East at the time was not important as a producer area. It was important because everyone in the oil industry would look at the Middle East as the, the future main area as production. What regards uh, the distribution of the Western interests in the, in the Middle East, uh, one can say that they changed very fast after the end of the, the, the World War. In 1947, when the war was over, the majority of the Middle East oil was controlled by the British interests. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is, uh, by the time the Middle East was producing uh, more or less 6% of the oil output of the world. It's a, a strange picture because today, as you know, the Middle East has much more than 40%. Uh, but at the time, it was, uh, it was the beginning of the oil production in the Middle East. And this was how <clears throat> the British and the American interests were uh, more or less uh, distributed. The, the British and, and the Americans were sharing the Kuwait uh, Corporation. Saudi Arabia was completely uh, dominated by the American corporations, as uh, still now. Uh, and then 
the the other three uh, areas of the the, the Gulf Persian, uh, Qatar, neutral zone, and Bahrain were not important. What you see here is not the importance of oil producing, but the, the percentage of American and British interest in the, in the corporation. And then in Iraq and Iran, uh, the Americans were already present, though the British still had the majority of the, of the, 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 the stocks. Uh, when you see, uh, I'm going to make it short, but it is important for you to understand. When you see uh, what was the importance, the relative importance of all this, you can see that uh, the, the, the Americans started to get control of the most important oil producers. For instance, you can see that in Saudi Arabia, which was now becoming a very important producer, uh, in 1956, the, the, the Americans uh, through Aramco, which was the, the corporation that controlled Saudi Arabia, were already getting about 28% of the total Middle East uh, output of oil. Uh, if you see what was the distri geographical distribution of oil output, you can see that um, this uh, column of Saudi Arabia was very influent in having this result, which is in 1956, <coughs> Taking into consideration what was the American control of the corporations and what was the output of these corporations, the Americans were already having control of about, almost uh, two-thirds uh, of the output of oil in the Middle East. The British had, were reduced to one-third. This is a very uh, contrasting situation when we, we consider this, and when we, and we put aside what was the political and military control of the Middle East. Because the Americans were already present, as you see, uh, in all the big oil producing areas. But the main responsible for, I can say, security uh, from the Western point of view was Great Britain the United States had no military presence in the Middle East. It was the second uh, range producer, Great Britain, that was paying the price of guaranteeing the, the, the guarantees of the military um, uh, Western presence. So there was a, uh, the political control and the economical control, the corporate control, were uh, unbalanced. Um, the, in 1947, the, 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 Britain, the, the British government had already said that this could not go on, uh, that <clears throat> they had no um, budget to keep uh, ensuring that the Western military control uh, could be supported only by Britain. And so they decided to withdraw from large areas of the Mediterranean. The British withdraw from Greece, withdraw from, from Turkey, withdraw from, uh, from Palestine, and they, what they did was, a, let's say, some kind of geographical adjustment so that they could keep what were their main interests in the oil industry. And this unbalancement, this, this sort of uh, contrast between corporate control and military control is very important because it uh, make that the, the British way of dealing with Arab nationalism, which was rising, came to be very different from what the United States and what the Western powers expected. Because the British were, uh, let's say, um, concentrated, were hanged to some important points and because of that, they were starting to have problems and to create difficulties for Western powers uh, in several points of the Middle East, just to give you some examples. Uh, when the Arab governments and uh, non-Arab governments of all producing areas like uh, Persia started to uh, push for an, a split of the profits, 
uh, the, the British did not have the means nor the will to give satisfying responses to all. They had a very bad experience in Iran, as you know. They had the boycott of the, the Persian uh, oil for two years. They were forced to get the Americans in because uh, they could not do without mediators, but this sort of brokerage uh, was at a very expensive cost. And they were already having problems, for instance, in the Gulf area, because their support of Kuwait and the neutral area, which was a, a border area with Saudi Arabia, were already making the British to have military um, uh, operations against Saudi Arabia, which was the main American uh, oil area in the region. So <clears throat> the British position was starting to get weaker and very stiff, very hard. The Americans were present in all the other areas of the Middle East. They, uh, as you can see, they had interests in all areas of the Middle East oil. All these columns in red are presence of the Americans. So they could have a much more, as you can say now, soft power in the region. Uh, that all American diplomacy for South American uh, to have a, a big smile and a big stick, they could make it m much more easier than the British because they were much more uniformly um, present in the, in, the, in the Middle East. They were not forced to have enemies or foes uh, according to different concentration of interests. And they were starting to have bigger problems with the Arab world with these features of the British presence. Uh, um, as you know, <clears throat> in the Eisenhower administration, Eisenhower was the American president of the time, the oil interests were very strong. Two of the most important uh, positions of the American administration at the time, the CIA and the State Department, were uh, given to the Dulles brothers, John Foster Dulles and his brother Alan Dulles, which who, who were oil men, were members of the, uh, they were lawyers and connected to the big oil corporations like Esson and, and uh, Mobile. So uh, I'm going to quote you just one, one sentence of Dulles uh, to see what, what the Americans were thinking about this English, the British presence in the, in the Middle East. It would have been disastrous for us, the United States, to play uh, uh, to, to, uh, in any plan of the Middle East if it seemed inspired by the British, which means that the, the, the Americans would prefer that the British organize military alliance like the Centre and all others and stay behind to let the British erode and be exposures to the erosion of Arab nationalism and stay as, long, as much as possible away from the British difficulties in the Middle East. So uh, this is more or less the, 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 the point uh, as regards Britain and, 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 and the United States. In the case of France, which was another major player in the Suez crisis, the position of France, uh, France was even uh, much simple to summarize. As an uh, Israeli historian uh, said, the, the interests of France in the Middle East uh, can be said in three words, Algeria, Algeria, and Algeria. The French were, at the time, absolutely obsessed with the Algerian problem, and they connected all the problems of the Middle East. Because for the French controlled only 6% of the Middle East oil. So they did not have these quarrels of the British and the Americans for the control of the oil of the Middle East. But they were very resolute to, uh, top, uh, to topple any government that could help the Algerian nationalists that were starting to uh, organize the guerrilla warfare, as you know, it started in 1954. So, <clears throat> what happened in Egypt, the second part of the international context? As you know, Egypt had a military coup in 1952, 
uh, nationalist government uh, in which the military were the, the main figures came to power. One of them was the, after Naguib was Colonel Nasser. And Egypt started a, a, pro, a program of modernization, which included, as you know, the building of a big dam, uh, which was essential for water and electricity to the uh, agrarian reform and the industrialization that the new government wanted to implement. For the purpose of building the dam, the Egyptians asked for a loan in the international uh, uh, banks. The World Bank uh, was supposed to give the loan, but with extra guarantees, and these guarantees included foreign government loans because the World Bank did not suppose that Egypt could pay such an, an amount. The, 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 the whole of the project was estimated in more than uh, one billion dollars at the time. And initially, it was supposed that the United States and the, 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 French, the British governments would put their own banking systems to support the Egyptian project. Because the Egyptian nationalist government started to collide with the British interests, and mainly with the control of the canal, the British and the American decided to withdraw the banking support to the Aswan project. This was in the spring of 1956. And the Egyptian government decided that to build the dam, it had to take a major step and nationalize the Suez Canal Company. The Suez Canal Company was a 19th century company. Uh, it had a French name, Compagnie Universelle du Canal Maritime du Suez. Uh, it was mainly British and French capital. The, the, the headquarters were in Paris. And, and nevertheless, it was an Egyptian registered corporation, uh, which means that the nationalization of the Egyptian government was legal. The Egypt was nationalizing an Egyptian company because it was registered as an Egyptian company. So from the legal point of view, there was nothing that the, the Western governments could do. What they were arguing against Egypt was that uh, by nationalizing the Suez Canal Company, the Egyptian government would be able to hinder, to put problems to the international navigation of, of the canal which was completely a phony argument because uh, the, the canal, while it was controlled by Britain, was never in really internationalized because Britain used the company, uh, the Swiss company, uh, for the political purpose she wanted. For instance, this is a quotation of a, a Portuguese diplomat. We, they were completely unsuspect, as you will see, uh, of sympathy to the Egyptian government. But they, when they were examining this argument of the, the Suez Canal being insulated from internal politics, which was an argument that now they said, they just said that Britain never insulated the, the Suez Canal from uh, internal politics because they have always used the Suez Canal for the British purposes. It's enough to say that during the World War, uh, the German ships could not pass, of course, through the Suez Canal because the, 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 the two world wars, because the, the British control of Egypt did not allow it. So the move from, uh, of the, government, uh, the Egyptian government was legal. This argument of the insulation from internal politics was not a real argument. The argument that the Egyptians did not have technicians to operate the Suez Canal was something that had to be proved, and the, 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 the Egyptian pilots and the voluntary, the, the voluntary technicians that came solved the problem, so this technical issue was also not a real argument. In fact, what the British and France governments wanted to do was to overthrow the Egyptian government. This was plainly to see, and the archive 
sources uh, all uh, confirm this, and, and we know exactly that the Egyptian government were trying to overthrow the, the Egyptian, uh, the British government wanted to overthrow Nasser the very next day after the nationalization of the Suez Canal. Uh, Eden, which was the, the British Prime Minister, uh, immediately told that he must go, he must go one way or another. So, <clears throat> which was the, 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 the way that was um, thought of to implement this politics of uh, the policy of uh, overthrowing the Egyptian government? As you know, uh, a direct intervention, a military operation of uh, France and England was at the time very risky, not only from the military point of view, but also from the political point of view, because the European powers were no longer dominating the, the world politics. So uh, f from July 26, which was the day Nasser announced the nationalization of the company, uh, to October, there were three months of several political and military plans made by England and France to overthrow the Egyptian government. The, um, you'll see uh, some maps to, to show the, this agitation, but uh, the, what came out as a, the last solution, solution was a proposal made by the French, uh, and uh, which was more or less like this. The French, the British, and the United States had signed in the mid-1950s uh, a sort of a draft agreement uh, preventing them to interfere in the Middle East political status as regards Palestine. As you know, Israel had uh, been independent, uh, with the partition of Palestine had created the Israeli um, state in 1948. After there was the first uh, war, uh, can, you can say Israel or Arab, not to say Israeli Palestinian, it's better to say Israel or Arab at the time. And the, these three the powers, uh, Britain, France, and the United States, after the war, had implemented uh, an agreement to not change the status quo that came out of this 1948 hour, uh, war. Anyway, the French started from the beginning to sell um, equipment which was not allowed under this agreement to the Israeli uh, government. There was a strong military link between the French, all the Fourth Republic uh, governments and the Israelis. And by the mid 50s, the French were already supplying the Israelis with Mirage, which was very sophisticated warplanes at the time. And so the French and the Israelis, but the, it, it must be said that uh, it was only, uh, solely the French to have the initial idea, the Israelis were compelled to follow. Uh, came out with a, a scheme which was more or less like this. Israel would make a preventive war against Egypt. Uh, it would occupy the Sinai Peninsula. And then uh, a military intervention of Britain and France would land in Egypt by parachute uh, landing and would create an interposition force. This would allow for Britain and France to reoccupy the Suez Canal, and in exchange, Israel would have a part of the Sinai, and this is also very important, a nuclear industry. Because part of the rewards given by the French to make this uh, extra services, which was the preventive war against Nasser, was to install a uh, first nuclear reactor in Israel. As you know, Israel is a nuclear power, and its nuclear program starts from 1956, based on this uh, uh, French 
uh, assurances. The Israelis were very uh, hesitant because they did not trust Britain at all. They trust the French, but did not trust the, the British at all. Uh, they were on the brink of uh, engaging on a war with Britain because of Jordan. As you know, the, the British still supported very harshly hardly the, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and the Israelis uh, were trying to eliminate and occupy the West Bank. So the, the Israelis had, were very suspicious about the British, but there was a secret uh, convention in Paris in October in which Ben-Gurion, Eden, and um, uh, Pinot and, and, and Guimolet of the French government came out with, the, with, the, with this scheme, which the Israelis, Israel has accepted with undercover this hidden reward of the nuclear uh, industry. So this is the main fact. Everybody knows this. And so far, I have not given you anything really new, because all this has been said and, uh, for, for, for several years after the, the Suez crisis. What happened? Um, I'm going now to to to, to come back uh, uh, some weeks before. Before this military intervention, which was the the, the 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 climax of the Suez crisis, what were the positions? And now I'm going to use some uh, uh, new material that uh, is now available and. Uh, and, and it was not only I who had access to, to it. The, as you know, the British and the French were absolutely convinced that they should topple the uh, uh, Nasser government. But the Americans, because of this different position they had towards all the Middle East, the Americans were supporting the Arabs. The, as you can see uh, by the, these graphs, uh, 28% of the Middle East oil came from Saudi Arabia, which was a major ally of Egypt, so the Americans would not dare to have problems with the, the Saudis. The Americans had, had a very different attitude. They did not want to engage in military interventions. They feared what would be the Soviet reaction. They did not want to um, break any rule of the United Nations. And besides, it was election year in the United States. Eisenhower wanted to be re-elected in November, so he was very far from giving anything that might uh, think that the Americans would do a war for the old imperialist countries in the Middle East. So when the British and the French government immediately told that they were going to, to war because of the Suez Canal, the American State Department, which was first adult, that was the, 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 the head of the State Department, came out with a scheme of a London conference in which 24 countries were engaged, invited to uh, organize a diplomatic reaction, reaction against the takeover of the Suez Canal. Portugal was one of those uh, 24 countries, and Spain also. The, the criteria were uh, countries that um, had bigger fleet, uh, had m m more tonnage passing uh, through the canal, or were more um, dependent on the Middle East oil. But in fact, all was arranged that from these 24 uh, countries that came to London, the majority of them would support anything that came out uh, in support of the Western countries. Uh, so Port Portugal and Spain corresponded to both of these criteria. Um, from this first London conference, which took place in uh, late August uh, 1956, came out the idea of organizing a Suez Canal Users Association. The acronym was SCUA. Suez Canal Users Association, which would have the, the political task of organizing the, the passage of the ships through the canal. The, the Americans came out with this idea because they thought that 
this would allow them to gain time. They, they could put some hot, uh, cold water in, in the British and the French government. And it could bring Egyptian, the, uh, the Egyptian government to the negotiation table, which was something that uh, Nasser never said he did not want. The, the only thing Nasser was completely against of, was to the idea of what he called the collective colonialism, some kind of association that could, in a way or another, uh, put the nationalization of the canal uh, put aside. Uh, so they did not, he did not want to give the, the sovereign rights of Egypt to control the canal to uh, this kind of international organization. And uh, anyway, the, 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 the difference between the Americans and the British and French position were very clear and were made public by a declaration of uh, 17, uh, 13 September. It was a press conference of uh, duels. And he, he said something like this. I, I think I have the, the, this quotation. The British press today says that uh, Britain plans to use an armed convoy to, to go to the canal. Would the United States support Britain? And he said, we don't intend to shoot its way through the canal. So the Americans said very clearly in the early September that they would never go in a military adventure in the Suez Canal. So this, mean, this, mean, this meant that the conference had only two ways. Either it could get the control of the canal given by the Egyptians uh, again voluntarily, or it would push the British and the French to go alone to uh, war. The, um, this was a very frightening position for all the other governments which were in the London conference, including the Spanish and the Portuguese governments, because even if they wanted very much, and you'll see why the Portuguese government wa wanted very much to topple the Nasser government, they were absolutely not uh, in the mood of going to, into war because of the British and French interests uh, alone. And so the, the, the Portuguese and the Spanish and the Italians uh, tried in the first London conference to get guarantees that this will never come to, to, to this point. Uh, the, 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 this declaration of duels saying that the United States would not go shooting its way through the canal saved the London conference and allowed for some other conferences that were to come. Okay, so this um, London conference ended with the SCUA proposition, the Swiss Canal Use Association, and the next step was like this. If the, the, there is not going to be a war, if the, the Americans, the British and the, the French were already planning this war since July. It was only a technical thing, but of course they would not say that in public. In public, the situation was like this. There was this school thing. Uh, the school thing was to solve the, the, the matter on diplomatic grounds. And now the, the, the question was, who, um, to whom is the tolls, the fees of passing the canal, be paid to? To the Egyptian government or to this international collective body that came out of the London conference? If the companies and countries passing through the canal would not like to pay the SCUA, they would have either to pay Egypt or to go around the Cape and boycott the Suez Canal. So the problem of the second and third London conferences was what to do about these um, three possibilities. Either paying Egypt, uh, either paying the SCUA, or if paying SCUA or being afraid of Egypt, it would be better to boycott the canal and go around the Cape 
as if the Suez Canal did not exist. Um, the, what, the, the Portuguese uh, um, position here stands for most of the countries that were at the London conferences because they all wanted to topple Nasser, but none wanted to pay the costs of either uh, paying the SCUA and be forced to uh, have problems in the canal with the Egyptian authorities or be forced to have the costs of going around the Cape and avoid the Suez Canal. So what did most of the countries? They had a very uh, strong rhetoric at the conference but were paying Egypt under the table. And so did the Portuguese government. The Portuguese foreign minister, for instance, said something like this. Uh, what, 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 what we have to do is to do away with the risk of a near canal boycott, which, once in course, would cause a serious upset in our supplies. At least now we can expect that our tankers will keep passing through the throughout canal. So the Portuguese government switched immediately their payments to the Egyptian government and wishfully thought they are not going to publish the lists of the countries we are, which are paying Egypt or no, or no or not, so we can pay them and be very uh, active in the rhetorics of the conference. The same thing did Spain, and the same thing did Italy, and all the rest. They switch their payments to the Egyptian government. In October, about 35% of the, the ships going through the Suez Canal were already paying the Egyptian government and were uh, driven by Egyptian pilots. So, for the British and the French, this was absolutely no solution. They would never pay the Egyptian government and they would never go around the Cape. Uh, you see, the, uh, the, the cost of going around the Cape was more or less 32% um, plus um, into imported oil. So uh, by the time the, to the Suez Canal, about 80% of the oil coming to Europe uh, was passing through the Suez Canal. So the, uh, the British would be um, affected two ways if there was a boycott of the Suez Canal. Uh, first, there, most of the ships passing through the Suez Canal, about a third were, were British. And second, because there was going to be oil cuts, uh, the consumption of oil would be cut down, which areas of the Middle East would produce less oil? Precisely the British control areas, which was Kuwait and uh, Qatar. So, uh, because um, Iraq and Iran had already their pipelines uh, coming to the Mediterranean. But Kuwait was the major British controlled area in the Suez Canal. And the, the damages this could produce to the British economy was considered absolutely appalling. And so, the, this solution of the boycott of the Suez Canal was never something that the British government really thought to do, but they said they would do because they had something else in mind, something else that was already in uh, active, being active plan since uh, July. So uh, <clears throat> to cut this, all this, um, uh, the, the funny thing is just a detail <clears throat> to give some moral comfort <clears throat> to the British and the French. The Americans said they would also compel their ships to pay uh, to the um, to the SCUA and not the Egyptian government. But the American flagships were about 5% um, uh, because most of the American ships would go throughout the Suez Canal with the flag of Liberia and Panama. So, so the Americans were paying the Egyptian government because there were very few American flagships coming through the Suez Canal. So even this meager consolation to the British and French government were you know, irrelevant. And <clears throat> in the press of the time, uh, the Americans, the, the British and French press of the time, 
uh, all they, 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 they always said that the, this school thing was a, uh, an American artifact to make uh, to, 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 to that Nasser could get away with this. This was a humiliation. It was by this time that the British and French government decided to take the case to the United Nations, with, which, which the Americans did not want because they always thought, and they were right, that the, the British and government and French were going to the United Nations to say that, you see, the United Nations did not solve the problem, so we don't have other solutions but military force. So going to the United Nations was the absolute proof that <clears throat> the London and Paris wanted to go to war. And in fact, uh, two days, um, uh, about a week after the United Nations um, debate on the Security Council came out the famous, uh, this was the first plan, the first military plan. Uh, but uh, initially, the British were thinking of bombing Alexandria. We, we, this would be appalling because a lot of civilians would be killed in this bombing. And then they were uh, planning going to the Cairo and then, then to, um, to, to the canal. This was a completely full, foolish plan because of the casualties that you, it would involve. And th th there was a terrible danger in, in this that all knew, which was that the, the Egyptian government w would allow them, of course, to, it would be powerless to prevent that the British came to the canal, but then they, they could make a guerrilla war that could last for years. Uh, the, the, something very close to what happened in Afghanistan later uh, was already uh, more or less forecast in Egypt. But this is the plan that came out, which was much more feasible. It was the preventive war of Israel. Israel would occupy the whole Sinai Peninsula, and then here, uh, I don't have the cursor, but you can see those arrows uh, in Port Said. The, um, the British and French uh, parachutes would land in the Suez Canal and would became an interposition uh, force. Now, it's just some pictures of the main intervenants. Here you can say, you see uh, Pinot uh, on the photo of the left. Eden and Dulles in one, in one of those uh, London conferences. Uh, this is Nasser and his foreign minister. I, I took these pictures from one of the most famous books of, of the, the Suez, just to show you the, some of the major intervenients. This is Guimolet, the French prime minister. Um, this what the, 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 the propaganda war was very strong, uh, and there was a lot of leaflets to be distributed to the population because the, the real target of the operation was the toppling of the Egyptian government. So there was to be a very heavy psychological war with leaflets and radio broadcasts and all that. It's one of some of the leaflets that were to be distributed. And in fact, <clears throat> even not uh, being so heavy as regards casualties, a lot of people died, even with such a uh, with with Plan Two, we, we, Plan Two was named the Shal Plan because it was designed by the the French chief of staff, uh, General Shal. So, um, last point of the conference uh, is uh, to concentrate on two issues, which will uh, in which we'll see some of the the, the most hidden uh, aspects of of the crisis. After the intervention, which failed, as you know, because military it was a success, but politically the, 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 the international forces had to, to pull out. Israelis were forced to pull out, and the British and French became in a very um, impossible position to sustain. And in January, most of the uh, forces had already started to disengage. The situation in the, the, the first half of 1957 was a success, succession of sessions of the SCUA in which the tall issues uh, came again. And I'm going to show you how 
this ended for two of the, uh, 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 of the players of this crisis, Britain and Portugal. But the case of Britain is very interesting and uh, it shows um, something that uh, was always in the mind of the, the British but uh, was never said and is usually not associated with the Suez crisis. One of the things that made the, the British want to topple Nasser, to control the Suez Canal, to be implemented in the oil areas, was the defense of the pound, the currency. Because, as you know, the real, this is a generalization, but you can say the real rallying class in England is and has been for the past three centuries the city is the banking system, which is really the main uh, rallying class in, in Britain. And the major object, uh, target of the British policy during the 20th century was to have an international currency that could um, be the source of a lot of financial incomes. Uh, having an international currency allows you to make loans, to have your currency uh, bought by third uh, parties, to, to have banking reserves uh, and to emit currency uh, at will. Uh, the pound has this privilege until at least uh, 1932, and then it started to share it very strongly with the, with the dollar. The, one of the major concerns of the British government after the war was to restore the pound as an international currency for non-dollar um, trade. And the, tra the pound had to be a convertible currency. The, the pound started to get back to the convertibility status in 1955, and a severe drainage of uh, pounds caused by oil losses would be the end of this dream of restoring the pound as, of, as an international currency. So that's why Nasser was such an enemy. Nasser was an enemy because if it could lead the other Arab governments to put in, to jeopardize the oil interests of, of England, more than the oil interests, it would be the pound that would be at stake. So when they all was lost, when the Nasser was not overthrown, when the national, uh, the, the control of the Suez was completely out of reach, the British had at least one very important compensation, which can be summarized by this. This was a note that the British government sent to the Portuguese government, but all other European governments which were present at the SCUA, and which states very clearly that Britain can be more or less satisfied with the international solution, which was the control, the, the, the Egyptian control of the canal, if the tolls of the canal were paid in pounds. Because at least this would make the pounds floatable in the Suez Canal. So the, the British would not be rid, get, get rid of Nasser, but at least the, 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 the currency in which the Suez Canal fees uh, was, were to be paid remained the pounds. This was given by the, um, the, the, the Egyptian government. It, and this, and of course the failure of the military operation, made that the new British government, because the previous one had fallen, um, <clears throat> accepted the outcome of the crisis. In the case of the Port Portugal, uh, the, as I told you, the, the, the Portuguese government was in, the Portugal, of course, had no direct interest in the Middle East, had no, uh, the smallest control of the, uh, or, or, or shareholder in any corporation. But Portugal was a colonial government. Nasser 
and the Arab nationalism was seen as uh, the major source of all evils as regards anti-colonial forces. Um, the radio of Cairo spread a lot of nationalist propaganda. The, the, national, the, the Egyptian government was starting to uh, give material aid to anti-colonial forces. As you know, they were supporting the, the FLN in Algeria and they were um, uh, absolutely committed to do the same in other uh, nationalist countries. And besides, there was already this, uh, at the infant, but uh, anyway, important in the future, movement of the non-aligned. So the, for Portugal, there was no, it's funny that Portugal had so uh, many reasons to topple the Egyptian government. When the Egyptian government had looked up for the Portuguese constitution to draw its own constitution, I don't know if you know that the Portuguese new state constitution was one of the inspiration, inspirations for the new Egyptian constitution. Egypt, Nasser was organizing a state which was, was not a very democratic one. Of course, this is all known. And one of the sources was the Portuguese constitution. But of course, this would not give much credit to, to Nasser uh, uh, on the eyes of, of Lisbon. Anyway, there was another thing that was very worrying, uh, uh, worrying very much the Portuguese government. If the Suez Canal was, as the official terminology uh, like to say, not insulated from internal politics, which means if the Suez Canal was controlled by the Egyptian government, then because Egyptian government was so close to anti-colonial governments and to the Indian government, the, colon the Portuguese colonies in Asia would be very jeopardized because all the connection of Portugal with the Indian colonies, as you know, Portugal still had territories in India until 1961. And all this was going through the Suez Canal. So what the Portuguese, had, the diplomacy had to do was in the NATO meetings, in the SCUA meetings, do all they could to topple the Nasser government. But in public, the Portuguese government wanted to look as the most peaceful country in the eyes of Nasser, because th th they could not stand the idea, especially after the failure of the military operation, of remaining the sole um, um, colonial power which was to be boycotted by Nasser. So uh, <clears throat> this is, for instance, one quotation from a minute of um, uh, conversation between the Portuguese ambassador in Cairo and Mohamed Fauzi, which was the Egyptian foreign government. Um, as you can see, Portuguese public standing was very positive in the eyes of the Egyptians. Uh, the, the Portugal's moderate and sensitive stand, because this was said in, the, in some of the public conference. It's true that Portugal government did not want to go to war, but in the NATO and SCUA uh, meetings, as I told you, was one of the most proactive in toppling, wanting to topple Nasser. But the, the, the funny thing is, is that, uh, I put this in bold, the Egyptian government kept reminding the Portuguese ambassador that the in, in spite of the good relations the Egyptian government had with the Indian, Indian Union, would not hinder nor comment and in any way the passage of ships transporting troops to Goa, Goa was Portuguese India. The, in, and he repeated to me, Egypt will not be against the passage of the Portuguese troops throughout the canal. This was, of course, a way of reminding the Portuguese government how dependent they were on the will of Cairo. I thanked the minister, uh, of course, and then he re replied back home, 
they know that we are completely dependent on their will, and so we have to keep a low profile in all this. So the, the Portuguese standing in all this was very hardliner in private meetings, but very soft in public statements because they depended on the Suez Canal passage. This ended very badly for Portugal because in the end, um, I think I have this, uh, the Daily Express uh, published a list of who goes in April 1957. Uh, almost certainly, which means countries that accepted the Egyptians' control of the canal, and you see the United States, Italy, Norway, Germany, Spain, Turkey, probably Britain, Australia, New Zealand. Britain was already passing through the canal because they had the guarantee that it would be paid in pounds. Probably not Portugal, definitely not France. So Portugal ended in a very bad company, this affair of the canal. To conclude, this shows how uh, really this was a turning point in the uh, Middle East for two reasons. The, the fact that uh, the major power after uh, October, uh, December 1956 would be only the United States. Britain and France were completely wiped out of the political and military map of the Middle East. <coughs> Means that uh, the, the United States interests would be much more, uh, let's say, um, covering a, 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 a wider range of issues that the British could not any longer keep. But doing this, they were, let's say, uh, crushing the small and uh, national and individual interests of the colonial powers. I could give you a lot of examples of what the French said about what would be the, the, the connections of the, the Middle East issues and the French issues, and they knew that under the new circumstances the, the, there was nothing to expect. The, the interests of the United States would be running the Western interests in a very different way that uh, it had been before. And it also shows that um, uh, in this crisis, as uh, in many others, uh, the, the national uh, policies were very different uh, under the cover of the, 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 pub the, the public consensus. You, you can see that SCUA lasted for at least one year. It always had produced statements, but uh, under the cover, uh, the, all the participants were doing their own national uh, policies as regards Egypt and, and as regards the, 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 the Swiss Canal. Uh, the, 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 the last in, final remark is that um, the, 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 this crisis also ended what could have been um, a united front of Arab nationalism. Because if it had been the, the British to, to be in the Middle East, probably the anti-colonial anti uh, feelings would have produced a much more uniform um, mood in the Arab public opinion. Uh, Nasser was counting on that. With the Americans taking over, they could much um, they, they, they could break this uh, so-called uh, unity of Arab public opinion because the, the, the Americans could much better than the British to select uh, who they would support more or less and the fact that there was only one Western uh, interlocutor, one, one Western superpower made them much more subtle and much more let's say, in a much more stronger position to deal with the several focus of Arab nationalism. And so, okay, I'll keep to that and I'll be ready to um, discuss any subject that you raise. Thank you. Any questions? Don't be shy, please. 
Well, I will start with just one. I I was curious what were the consequences for the Portuguese when they in the second conference they voted against what was expected to vote. If there was any uh, consequence inside Europe, um, they, uh, the the Portuguese government um, made clear that uh, the the like all, all the other countries, they, they would never go to war on that. But they do, did not say publicly. It was something undercover. And they, most of the things they, they did, they did like all the other countries which were under the table, for instance. Nobody never said if they were paying really or not to the Egyptian government. The Portuguese government, for instance, used um, an argument which was like this. We don't have the force, nor the moral force, nor the right to compel our companies to pay to the Egyptian government or the school. The companies do what they like. Of course, this was completely false because the companies operating in Portugal would do what the government wanted them to do. But they used that argument to say that they could, know, they could not tell if they are going to pay Egypt or not. And so they escaped it. All they expected was that never came in the press a list of the companies that were really paying Egypt or, or not. And in fact, it came only in, in the end. So uh, they, they, they were trying to, to get away, really, it's the expression. But, ah, sorry, but you asked also in uh, NATO and, and all uh, the other things uh, about the. Um, Colonial commitments, the, the Portuguese government knew that NATO would never uh, allow them legally to take material, NATO material to the colonies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the 1960s, when the, the, Port the Portuguese government had to fight the, the nationalist wars in Africa, they in fact took NATO material, NATO planes and NATO heavy equipment to Africa, but this was Never legally. The, the Americans knew about that, but uh, it was not legal. Uh, so they knew that uh, everything that might happen, uh, let's say, negative, negative aspects, they, they, they had to, to do it by the, themselves. Some questions? No? Sí, okay. de acuerdo. Um, creo que has hablado del, del control de los recursos petrolíferos por parte de, de las potencias europeas como Reino Unido, también Estados Unidos. Eh, no recuerdo cuándo se fundó la Organización de Países Exportadores de Petróleo, la OPEP, pero recuerdo que el único país no árabe de la OPEP era Venezuela, o sea, uno de, del único país eh, que Irán, era miembro que Irán. No ar... Irán, ah, Irán tiene, también, de acuerdo, sí. Eh, bueno, de América Latina era, era Venezuela. Y recuerdo que en aquella época Venezuela defendía una política de control de precios para exportar poco y exportar caro, así tener ingresos ¿no? para hacer las políticas de la industrialización por sustitución de importaciones, se decía. Y re recuerdo que fue, pre fue precisamente los países del Golfo, con, con, Arabia, con Arabia Saudí, los que atacaron esa política de la OPEP de control de precios para volver a vender mucho y, y barato, ¿no? Y cómo, cómo fue precisamente estos países del Golfo quienes destruyeron la, la, esta política de control de precios de la OPEP que revertía en, en un desarrollo endógeno ¿no? para, para estos países. Sí, um, sabes que... Uh, uh, ok, I'm going to turn to English, but for me and for you also. Um, The, the, the oil prices were falling down during the 1950s and 60s. So the, the, the OPEC countries, the, the OPEC cartel was formed in 1960. And it was formed because the, 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 the oil producers wanted two things, <clears throat> to prevent the continuous fall of the, the price of oil and to get um, Uh, more or less um, stable uh, a sta stabilization of the profit sharing that they had already got in the 1950s. In the 1950s, the, the, uh, uh, I mentioned uh, that when I was trying to say 
why Britain was no longer able to keep the, the, the global Western interests in the Middle East. The fact is that in the mid-1950s, there had been a major um, shift in the oil sharing of profits. Why? Because usually uh, the, the companies would get more or less 75 of the posted prices and the producer countries about 25%. But because of uh, Venezuela and Saudi Arabia and Iran, <clears throat> uh, in the mid, uh, at the early 1950s, the, the, the oil producers started to demand a 50-50 split, which means that from the profits after the cost of production, the, um, there will be, um, let's say, uh, equal parts for the producer. It, this is, uh, technically, it was the posted price, which was the barrel at the um, uh, point of export. Of course, the companies would get much more money in the European or the American markets, but at the moment of the barrel was shipped, the, the price uh, the, uh, at the shipping point would be split, the profit would be split in 50-50 percentage. The Saudis got that because what the American corporations lost by giving the Saudis this upgrade was given back by the American government in taxes. The American government got that. The British did not want to give that, that to, to Persia, and that's why they had to uh, boycott the Persian government. And the Persians, as you know, Iranian nationalized the, the British Petroleum Company in Iran. For two years, the, the Persian oil was suffering an embargo. The British did not give them the 50-50, and they nationalized the company. And as you know, uh, this ended with a coup d'etat in Persia and the Americans entering into the, Ameri the Iranian oil. So it was a very costly operation to the British. So by the mid-1950s, uh, the oil producers did already get this 50-50 split. And all they were doing uh, in the second half of the 1950s and during the 1960s was to keep this position because with the falling of the prices the, the, there was always the danger that the companies would come back to the previous arrangements. It was only in the, 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 the final um, part of the 1960s that when the market uh, changed and the consumption, of, the demand of oil started to be bigger than the production of oil, that the Arab countries had the conditions to start this so-called les années de bourrez, as the French say, and started to push for the prices, Libya and then Venezuela again, and then the, 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 the major um, um, leverage of the prices of the 1970s and 1973. But until then, it was the, the, the opposite. It was, uh, let's say, a buyer's market and not a seller's market. Thank you very much for the, uh, this talk. It's, it's about internal <laughs> politics in Great Britain. Uh, how was important the uh, internal tensions in Great Britain? Because it's an interesting <coughs> time because Churchill was gone and it was Anthony Eden and then Macmillan. And so I don't know if we can talk about Great Britain because inside it, not only uh, between the government and the corporations, but in the government, it was a, a difficult time or a crisis time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know uh, how it uh, 
uh, if this is if if this was important in the in the Suez Canal. Yeah, the the, the, the in fact it was heavy uh, uh, as regards internal politics in, in England because, uh, uh, as you know, the, the, the Conservatives have, had come back to power uh, in 1951. Uh, they had lost uh, the power after the, the, the war. That was the first big experience of the Labour government. And when the Conservatives came to power, one of the main purposes, but as you know, the Conservative Party was very close to the city interests. So one of the major goals of the new government was to make the pound again an international currency, because this was the utmost goal of the financial interests of the city. And so the oil interest in the Middle East and the, this Egyptian uh, crisis um, were felt very hardly by, 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 by the city and by the nuclear strength of the conservative power. Just a, a comment. You can see now, um, for instance, the contrast with something that is happening uh, today. The Brexit would never happen if the city was severely hit. Because if the city was touched very hardly by the Brexit, they would never allow the Conservative government to make a referendum on that. It is the industry and trade, let's say the real activities, that are hit by the Brexit, not the city. And so the, nothing happens in, in, in Great Britain uh, passing through the Conservative government that hits really the city. But this Egyptian thing was really hitting the city because the, the possibility that the Nasser government uh, could overthrow the Jordanian, the Iraqi, the, the Saudis, and the Kuwait governments, that the, the, the British oil interest could be lost and indirectly the pounds could be affected was a major uh, blow for the city. So, the credibility of the politicians of the um, Conservative uh, uh, Party was connected to the degree of success. That's why Eden was so keen in getting rid of Nasser, because he knew that no Conservative government would be in power if he could not solve this problem. Okay? And the, 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 the question is, uh, had, was this military plan consensual among the conservatives, it was not, because most of the people who were waiting for um, Eden to fail, like Macmillan, which was all the time expecting Eden to fail. Um, when this plan uh, was um, completely failure, and Eden had to resign, Macmillan came out, but came out immediately proposing this sort of deal to Egypt. Okay, we let you stay with the canal, but you keep getting the, the, the fees in pounds. And so this at least saved part of the worries of the conservative government. It, would, it could not prevent the rise of Arab nationalism all over, and the, the British government had a, a lot of commitments with Jordanians and, and the Iraqis. The Iraqi was lost two, year, two years after, uh, but the Jordanian was kept, and Kuwait, most important of all, was kept. And Saudi Arabia was kept. So Saudi Arabia affected more the Americans and the British, but uh, it was all part of the, the, the scheme. So the success in solving this um, the crisis was connected to the credibility of the Tory government. can end here then. Thank you very much for your attendance and thank you again, Professor Masia. Thank you.